and then we'll also, you know, and it's sort of, you know, whatever you guys want to go, go over for this. And as more people get here or don't, then, you know, we'll just kind of go whatever, whatever direction your whims take us today. So anything in particular that was tricky about the practice so far? I feel like pretty good about section one, like the naming and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I, I found myself able to go through that like fairly quickly. But then as soon as I started working on section two, it was like, oh gosh. <laughs> it's just the, uh, I don't know. I don't think I've put enough time into memorizing what so to do. Are we feeling okay about the vocab sections too, or the is vocab, it really the actions? Yeah, the vocab wasn't as solid. That took me a while. Um, when I would say bear in mind also that not all of these are equally as important, mm -hmm. long term especially. And this whole section is only six out of a hundred points. Yeah. Right. So if you get two thirds of these right, oh man, man, I'm under 70% on that section. Okay, that's a total of two points that you lost. Yeah. Right. So it's not that critical that you're you're perfect on it. Um uh, it, but it is one that if you if you study well by memorizing vocab, it's one that you can get 100% on without too much extra trouble. Um, but it's definitely a, like a cost benefit, right? Look at where the points are versus how much work is it going to take to get to make it perfect. Yeah. Um, and probably most of what you're going to see is going to or want to see is in the reactions, right? Yeah. So that's. But I just find myself really having to like dig through notes and the book for these instead mm -hmm. of just like being able to look at something and know how to solve it or like where to put things or where to move things. Right. Um, I think I, I don't know. I, I definitely haven't dedicated the time that I could to it, uh, but. Well, for starters, one thing you can do is remember that uh, if you're going to spend you know, the most efficient, make the most efficient use of your time mm -hmm. when it comes to studying is the end of chapter material is almost always the most condensed form of what's most important. Um, you're not going to see the mechanisms there, but as far as like being able to get through and really drill down on on classifying the reactions, it's pretty helpful. Um, and I think I took took those sections and put them in the. Yeah, I think you did too on the mm -hmm. weekly papers. Um, at the very so the summaries, you know, for addition reactions, the summary is a pretty good look at all the reactions from chapter eight, right? So, and at this level, like this is not showing mechanisms, not showing any of the fine points. So, you know, unless you're, you know what you're looking for, this might not be everything you need, but it should be enough that you can say, oh, like hydration, Markovnikov, no rearrangement with this sort of as your, as your hint. Um, so I, yeah, this, this is probably where I would go. And I'm less concerned that you know the names than you are Markov, Mikov, or Anti, and what's the general gist of that reaction. Brad, is your hair shorter too? Yeah. It's, it's nice to finally get shorter hair when you've had long hair for a bit, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't know nothing about that. Yeah. <laughs> I've been wearing a hood the last couple of weeks since I cut it because it's been very cold. Mm. Now I'm used to it, so I suck. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, it looks nice. And if anybody wanted to see the brominated cinnamaldehyde samples for recrystallization. I didn't check that out a couple days ago. Last week. This was all your, your stuff. Right? Yeah. Oh, 
wow. but you can tell just by looking at which ones the raw or the stuff that you did once and then the light brown i i recrystallized one more time after you and then the, the white stuff is really purified Ooh, found this in the library hey this is a classic are they getting rid of it or no i just okay. checked it out Ooh, there's some good figures there that's actually for being as old as it is, that's a pretty good figure. Yeah, I, I thought it was neat. I wanted yeah, to... I've never actually read this version of it, but it's a pretty, it's a, it's literally a, a seminal text in that, like that is one of the go-tos. Okay, cool. Um, that never goes out of style. Cool, that's good so, to know. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't teach Gen Chem from it exclusively, <laughs> but having had Gen Chem, that's a pretty good one. Cool. Um, so can we go through like on section two the reactions and just um do all of them? yeah do them <laughs> just to make sure I was I I'm like thinking correctly on the ones I was able to put something down for yeah let's bring her screw to one print like the last couple pages ah well then I just a periodic table and stuff. It, there was only like one page of the, I think, of the supplement stuff in this one. I mean, really, the, um, it's predominantly just the, the periodic table, and really, you guys don't even hardly need that at this point. It's that's more just as a safety blanket. Um, it's like, it's like a couple of pages of problem. all the way from page seven on. Didn't print. I don't know what. I, what that might, yeah, that might be yeah, it, right? write it out on there. But you can see it on. Yeah, I can see it on my computer. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that's. So if you can see it on your computer, it's probably not something that I can do from my end. No. no okay. I was just like, because sometimes oh, I, I went that. through this whole thing and didn't look at the page of part of the formula. I did not go through this whole thing yet. <laughs> So this will be fun. <laughs> All right, so and I'm going to try to give you a little bit of context in the instructions. So, you know, when I'm writing something in the instructions, I try to keep the instructions short so that it, if it's in there, it's because it's important. Um, if multiple products are expected in equal amounts, but draw both products. And this, this includes drawing all significant products in the case of radical chlorination. So specifically calling out chlorination, we want to see everything because it chlorinates everything. Um, and it's hard sometimes to pick what the most prevalent product will be. Um, so as far as, as classifying these, closed, closed book without any resources in front of you, um, the way that I would approach these is for most of them is at the very least, if it has light, I know it's going to be free radical. And I know there's only a couple of free radical reactions that we do, right? Predominantly, we brominate things. We pull off a hydrogen and we replace it with a bromine. Other than there was that one case where you can break a pi bond. Um, but for the most part, that's what we're looking at for free radical reactions. All right, so even without having done any of the other studying, if I at least have that in my back pocket, Okay, I don't know exactly where it's going to brominate because maybe I don't remember what NBS is or what it does, but I know I'm putting a bromine on it somewhere. All right, so, and, you know, if we, with best, if with all of the, um, all of the information, you know, you might be able to remember, okay, that stands, the B stands for bromo, so I know it's not a chlorination. And it, you know, hopefully it tweaks, it triggers something in your brain to say, okay, wait, that's not just the addition, because this was the one that was different than just the addition. But this is the must be the allylic one, right? And so then from there you'd say, okay, well it's got to be one of these two is going to get a bromine replacing a hydrogen. So from that you can say, okay, well.
you could wind up with the, this is a kind of a tricky one because you wind up with some stereochemistry issues, right? I did not specify what stereochemistry was here to begin with because it was, it's not a chiral center, but all of a sudden by adding a bromine, you make it a chiral center. So basically you can have the cis and the trans and this, both of the cis versions are gonna be different because they're gonna be different stereoisomers. So, because if you took this and flipped it like a pancake, they both would be going into the board because bromine would be down here, right? So you'd wind up with that plus, and again, this is, this is gonna be, you know, for full, full credit. And that would be the methyl still down there. And then if they're, if they're trans, there's gonna be the two versions of it as well with the methyl up and the bromine down and the bromine up and the methyl down, All right? So this is one where there are a variety of, of products right here, but one of the keys to recognize here is like we were talking about in class today. And so if all you did was just write that, three out of four points, maybe two and a half out of, of four points, it's still better than half the point because you at least recognize what the general gist of the reaction was. If we wanted to get really specific, we wind up making an intermediate though that winds up looking like like that, right? Which can resonate. Although you don't, oh, sorry. I was thinking that it was close enough that was gonna give us a uh, tertiary. No, that's not gonna work. So um, you wind up with, Another product though, but, and really I'm looking for, um, for one of, and this is probably not, this was not a great reaction to use as an example um, on the test because it winds up with, you know, four different stereoisomers of one product. And then you have a resonance structure. You have four different stereoisomers of that one as well. Um, it was not the intention when I wrote this one. I'm not trying to give you those super tricky 15 possible products. Um, on this sheet, it just, I wasn't being careful enough with the way I did this. Um, really, actually, it would be as simple as if the methyl group was there. Now, all of a sudden, that makes it so we're only going to have one product because that's a tertiary allylic carbon. And now, all of a sudden, you can just get the R and the S version of the same one. Right, you don't have the cis and trans, each of which that have an R and an S. Um, so if if the methyl was there, that would be more like what I would be trying to ask is one where there's maybe two stereoisomers. All right, so this one, and it, it, yeah, the, the reactions that are the most unique should probably be the easiest to at least recognize signs for, right? Even if you don't remember what the DMS part does here, we only have one reaction that does those, that involves ozone, right? So it's ozonolysis. And remembering what that means is another trick, is another trick I realized, but the only, you know, it's, recognizing it inside of associating that's my reaction this is my reaction just takes some practice um, until it becomes second nature you don't have to go through a mechanism every time in fact that'll probably slow you down too much on this um, we want it to be almost second nature to at least get close even if you mix up markov and Nicole versus anti on some All right so ozone i know i'm breaking that it's a triple bond, so full credit would be recognizing that makes a um, carboxylic acid on both sides. And then if it's just a single carbon that's left on one side, that goes all the way to CO2. So we'd be making, so the triple bond that we broke on this side turns into the carboxylic acid. We place all three of those bonds with oxygen bonds. And that last carbon that's off by itself is going to get turned all the way into CO2. 
if there was a, a longer branch over here or longer chain, then you would just wind up with the carboxylic acid on both sides, right? So if it was six carbons with the triple bond right in the middle, you'd get three carbons here and three carbons there. Correct? So even if it's not a terminal alkyl, we can still do osmolysis? Correct. In fact, that's, you see that a lot. In fact, let's do a good practice. Let's go back. I'm going to go back to one of the nomenclature problems. That one. Let's say we did ozonolysis of this one. Now we've got a triple bond. It's not a terminal alkyne. So what you get is you replace both ends with a carboxylic acid. If it happens to be a ring structure where you're breaking a double, a double or triple bond, you just wind up with that opening up and you get that functional group on each side. If it's a chain, you get two separate molecules, but if it's a ring, you just get a chain. All right, so in this case, if you've got a total of eight carbons around, your molecules still, you're still gonna have eight carbons at the other end. You're just gonna wind up with carboxylic acid for, Carbon one, let's say that this is, we'll, we'll number them in, uh, shoot, where's the, there's an eraser tool here, but, um, all right, well, I can't use the eraser tool. So, so Carbon one, what was carbon two is this one closest to the fluorines. So this is carbon one. Now on the, it's going to go the, all the way around the other way to get to the other carbon. So it's eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's my other. my other carboxylic acid group. So on one of these sides, you have the two chlorines, right? Still the same number of carbons, just split in half at that, at that um, triple bond. And if it was right in the middle, we wind up with two separate molecules. Um, this is, Ozonolysis is one of the reactions for alkynes that doesn't depend on it being terminal. There's really the only one that depends on it being a terminal alkyne is if we're going to use it as a nucleophile. The rest of them, if you have an alkyne buried in the middle of the molecule, doesn't affect the mechanisms really so much. All right, so in terms of classifying these, no, no light, no halogens, so not free radical. Phi bond tells us it's probably some form of an addition reaction. Most of our reactions with phi bonds are addition reactions, right? So then it just becomes a case of, okay, well, I might not remember this specifically, but if it's gonna be an addition reaction, I'm adding something to each side. It's definitely not hydrogenation because they don't have hydrogen gas. It's not bromination or chlorination because I don't have any halides. What class is really left at that point, right? Of our addition reactions. What's the other class that we spent all that time on? That's the more specific name of this one, but what, what does that fit under the umbrella of? What type of reaction is that? You remember what we called it? Hydration. Hydration, right? If it's not bromination or hydrobromination or chlorination, it's probably hydration, right? So we're adding an OH to one side, we're adding a 
hydrogen to the other side. Except we do have a little case of weirdness happening here. We have ethanol as our nucleophile instead of water. So it's not truly a hydration, but it's that same mechanism. It still would be considered oxymercuration, demercuration. We're just going to attach an ethanol to one side instead of attaching an OH. So with that in mind, now we have to remember, okay, here's my nucleophile. I'm breaking this pi bond, I'm adding hydrogen to one side, nucleophile to the other side, which goes where? So Markovnikov or anti? And that's one where if you do have the mechanism memorized, you can work it, work it out which one it is by looking at, okay, I'm making this intermediate, which means this attack has to come from, from this side. That should be a last case though last case resorted because there's a lot of places to mess that up um, and it takes a lot of time. And so the, you know, really you want to, I find it easier to remember the exceptions generally. There are fewer anti-Markovnikov reactions than Markovnikov. So if you remember what the anti-versions are, well, I don't remember specifically this reaction, but I know it's got to be Markovnikov, right? So make, make efficient use that way, kind of class, group things into classification um, as efficiently as you can. So we're gonna add an ethoxy group on the more substituted carbon. So there's our ethoxy group. The more substituted carbon is right there. And we also added the other hydrogen that we added was on this side. But that's identical to the other substituent there. So we don't actually even wind up with any stereochemistry in this case, right? Because it's identical both directions around the ring. Fred? Would you want us to show the addition of the hydrogen right there? It's not necessary. If you do for your own sake of you know, counting atoms and making sure you, you didn't miss something, then then I won't mark you down. But you, it doesn't need to be there. If you just answered all of these with purely skeletal structure and you did it all perfectly, that's fine. So triple bond, more pi bonds, right? Which means what, and it's not ozone. So what's our other type of reaction basically for all carbon, carbon, pi bonds? It's the same class of reaction as really the rest of them. It's, a, it's gonna be an addition, add something to both sides. Uh, you might not remember specifically what the mechanism is or what this one's called, or does it technically fall under the umbrella of oxymercuration, demercuration, because it looks a little different. But there's a lot of similarities with the fact mercury shows up here and it shows up here too. It's an addition reaction where you're going to take your pi bond, you break a pi bond, add something to each side, and there's our nucleophile. So this is a true hydration reaction. And so the, the three out of four answer here would be to draw this as the enol form, right? So you're gonna break one of the pi bonds, replace it with an OH on one side, and a hydrogen on the other side. Stereochemistry doesn't matter because it's identical on either side. Well, let's think about that. Let's draw the product. So when I write it like this way, sometimes you have to redraw it to see to see that. Because and there's also the fact that these are both secondary carbons, right? Which means I could have done that too. And right, so this is one where the stereochemistry is going to be a little tricky. So, but either way, so I'm going to start by just drawing the red one. 
um, on carbon three, we added an OH and we had a pi bond to one side of it. So one, two, there's carbon three. And it's between carbons two and three was the remaining pi bonds. And the other version would just be putting the OH on this side on carbon two instead of carbon three. They're both the Markovnikov product because they're both carbons are equally substituted, right? So we would expect approximately equal amounts of these two. That's your three out of four answer. The four out of four answer was recognizing that this is going to turn around and rearrange itself. Because remember, enol is not very stable when you have an alkene next to an alcohol. They'll go through that tautomerization where you basically move the pi bond, swap a pi bond in the hydrogen, and wind up with the ketone. And so the stereochemistry didn't really matter here because. Both of the carbons that have an OH are sp2, right? So no asymmetric centers. I drew these as the trans conformer or the trans isomer, but it doesn't really matter because immediately upon forming this, it turns around and makes this, and this doesn't have a system of trans. Right? And even if this turned around and reacted, because it is an equilibrium, right? So it would go back to the enol form some small percentage of the time, but it's gonna make a mixture of the cis and the trans anyway when it does that, right? So it doesn't really matter if it's gonna turn around and rearrange, it doesn't really matter whether you draw it as the cis and the trans at this point. Would you prefer to see both the enol and the ketone? This is what I'm really looking for. If you just gave me these, that's full credit answer. But as far as classifying it, remembering, oh, that was the hydration, which means I get here, and that should trigger something. Like, oh, that's an enol, that does something, even if you don't remember what it is, right? And then you can at least give it your best shot for the next part. And then I can give you three and a half out of four, even if you don't get the ketones right. What's the first thing that stands out about this one? Excess sodium amide. And what is that? What is sodium amide? I know, I know what the formula is, but what, uh, what does it do? Broadly speaking. Alkyne. Makes alkynes, yeah. It's a really strong base was the other thing I was looking for. It's a really strong base then it also is really good at promoting elimination reactions, right? The result of that is that it makes alkynes. And really at this point, that's all we've seen it used for is making alkynes. So that's a good, okay, clue in on that, right? It just takes practice to become second nature on some of these. So then it's a, a matter of, okay, well, where is it going to make the two alkyne or the alkyne? Well, the two eliminations are going to happen here and here, right? So we would expect the alkyne but then there's too many right. bonds on that carbon. So we can't do an alkyne right in between those two. You do a rearrangement though, right? You do a rearrangement. Really what it does is going to drive it to the end of the molecule. Basically, there's enough force, enough thermodynamic drive 
to push it to whichever end of the molecule it needs to go to to be able to make it a terminal alkyne. And so our first thought might have been, well, it's right there, but then you get carbon five bonds and you should look at that and it should make you recoil in horror. Um, <laughs> so, but what that means is, okay, we'll find the end of the molecule where you could put a terminal alkyne. And that's where it's going to be, right? We had, if we move the two bromines, we have methyl butane. And our, our high bond, our, where we're going to make this is going to be over here. So we wind up with And does the stereochemistry matter once we remove those bromines? We had some stereochemistry here. It, it does not. Why not? Because the carbon that was our center now has two of the same situation. Right. This carbon was that was a chiral center now has two identical methyls on it, right? And this carbon wasn't the chiral center to begin with. It just looks like it might have. In because it has a wedge it's drawn, right? But that's more as a result of this one than that. So we just get this. And then it's okay, ethyl bromide, bromoethane. Good leaving group, good nucleophile. So we're taking this molecule and sticking an ethyl group on one side of the triple bond. And so we wind up with. So the two blue carbons are the new ones that we added. Those are these ones. The red ones are the ones that we started with over here. Probably double check that this is all actually going to be legible since I'm not using the real whiteboard at all. Legible ish. It'll be better now. All right, so page one done. That wasn't so bad, right? It only took us, you know, half an hour, so a quarter of your total time <laughs> with collaboration. I thought it was helpful. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I, there's really not, there's not a good way to test how fluent you are in these reactions other than to give you a little bit of time pressure. So, you know, I apologize. And this is probably a little bit more. This is last year's test. And last year's test was a Zoom class. And Zoom class, the way that I'm, I make so I don't have to regulate cheating or, or using outside resources, I say, okay, well, it's, it's open book, but if you stop to look everything up, then you're not going to finish. I purposely did extra time um, pressure last year to make sure that you still had to have it all really ready. Um, so these are probably a little bit more intense than what I'll give you. Yours will the same category um, as far as like you should be ready for it to look like this, but they'll probably be a little bit easier. No, I wouldn't count on it because sometimes I write tests that I think are easier and they're not. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, and I'm trying to also, when I write this test, just to give you a little insight into why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it, it's um, 
one, if you guys show up to class and you finish your assignments and your quizzes, you're probably sitting pretty comfortably at an A, right? Across the board, if you show up and you turn in stuff on time, you probably have a mid, mid A at least. If I'm gonna separate, you know, really figure out who knows it the best, then I kind of have to make the tests a little bit harder than normal. It's the same thing Bruce does with his math tests, right? There's the 80%, 80% of you will get 80% of the test right. And the other 20% are either gonna fall below or above if we do our jobs right. It's a binomial distribution centered around 80% is what we're going for. In a second year class that feels really harsh because you guys are all used to getting A's um, and mostly pretty good at taking tests. It's not true, I've had multiple group classes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but so yes, so I, I realize that this is a stretch uh, in terms of getting stuff done in the time you have. So also sort of optimize that, you know what the structure is going to be and where the points are going to be arranged. Get yourself into a spot where you can get 80% of those points pretty as quickly as you can. And then worry about getting those last 20 to push yourself up into that 90s if you can, if you have time for it. I'm actually pretty excited to see you, but if you're going to say with number eight here. Oh, exactly. Ah. I didn't even know what to do with that one. I like looked at it and was like, nope, all right. <laughs> that looks familiar, right, Brad? Yeah, it's, it, it, it isn't like nope, deceptive. Nope, nope. It looks like it's just going to be, you know. But so you have, you have extra knowledge of this reaction <laughs> that my students from last year did not have. Um, if there is a reaction that does not behave the way it's supposed to, I'm not testing you on, do you have the exceptions memorized at this point? What we would normally expect this to do is to be a bromination where you put a bromine up and a bromine down and you're gonna get two stereoisomers. Realistically, what happens in the lab is you put the first bromine on one of these two and the second one goes where somewhere on the molecule <laughs> um, because there's a lot of rearranging that happens along with this um, the course of this reaction. So all I was would be looking for is what the classic explanation would be. Um, and again, I probably won't get, throw you anything in this section that's something that you've not seen before. Last year, being that it was open book, I threw a couple wrinkles in that say we hadn't really talked about bicyclics at all. So I put this in there to see who was going to be able to do something with it knowing they had extra resources and also therefore extra time because they were probably able to get through the rest of it faster. What's funny is they probably looked that up. <laughs> so paper that they found and they were like, oh my God. <laughs> right. Um, and that, that becomes really obvious when I'm grading it too. Um, so yeah, you know, when something comes out of left field, when we're grading tests, we know where it comes from. It's, People aren't that clever. We know it came from Google, and that's why it doesn't make any sense compared to what we've talked about in class. But now you guys are all in person, which means both harder and easier because you don't have that ability. You don't need to be paralyzed by excess information. You've got what you've got when you get to the test, right? All right, we're getting to the point though now, and I haven't experimented with doing this in a long time, where I'm thinking a half page of handwritten notes, half page one-sided of handwritten notes would be reasonable to, to allow you guys as a um, way to remember things. And so you might have to be careful about how you organize it. You don't that half page is not enough to put all three reaction summaries on by, I mean, this isn't a challenge. Maybe you could, um, but if you do that, that's not necessarily right. One of the things that was, um, that I've seen before that somebody at the uh, engineering school of Colorado did is um, the, in the situation like this, they were, they wrote, they essentially tripled their um, page area by writing in three different colors and then having two different sets of, or three different sets of glasses of certain uh, colors to filter them out. I like it. 
as the as the instructor if you're going to put that kind of effort and thought into it then by all means you're, you're allowed to do that you didn't break any of the rules um, right exactly exactly um so but think about how you're going to organize it like it's you might be better off with rather than all the reaction summaries doing something like hydroboration equals Mark anti Markov Nikov hydration like sort of a like way you can remember what the stereochemistry might look like hydration with the poison catalyst is sin addition those kind of details because most of what should be on the reaction summaries you should have down especially if you have a little clue to remind yourself all right and i'll put this we have almost everybody um, but i'll put i'll put on an announcement later reminding everybody and i'll i'll mention that in there as well so you won't forget off page, handwritten, not printed. And if you handwrite it and then photocopy it, I'll count that as still handwritten. I suppose I don't know why you would do that, but <laughs> like these are the sort of questions that you get asked when you when you do you know make a challenge like you get half page notes. Another hydroboration oxidation, right? Or sorry, uh, oxymercuration. Water is our nucleophile, so it's an OH. It's the oxymercuration, which was Markovnikov. It's not the exception. So we're putting nothing else is changing. So at the very least, with all these. As soon as you recognize it's not one of those reactions that changes the carbon skeleton, you can just redraw all of your carbons exactly where they were. Just leave off the pi bond and then go back and then add your last piece. So because I put it on there, you have to draw this whole thing, but it really doesn't matter doesn't affect the rest of the molecule really other than you get no wage there and this is what if it was the acid catalyzed it would still be Markovnikov but there's rearrangement allowed so at that point you would wind up with a methyl shift and you'd be putting your OH on this carbon if this one's this is the answer to this one. And full credit being both versions of it. All right, we are going to get a stereo center, but it's not going to favor one over the other because we didn't start with a three dimensional stereo center. <clears throat> If you, I technically, I suppose this should have, should also be a drawn as a stereo center because that quaternary carbon is a stereo center. Uh, no, it's not, is it? Both directions around the ring. So, no, so it really doesn't matter. All right, so as long as you recognize I made a stereo center and therefore I should, and I should have both versions of this in equal amounts. How do you say the form of sodium or boron? Sodium borohydride. So anytime you've got hydrogen that's and hydrogen is more electronegative than anything else, it's almost always going to be some version of hydride. Um, if it's just BH3, it's borane because it's more like the, the methane equivalent of with boron instead of carbon. Um, but if you've got extra H minuses floating around, it's going to be something hydride. The other really common one that we'll use that's even stronger reducing agent is lithium aluminum hydride. Um, this one will react similarly to sodium metal if it get ex gets exposed to water in the just in the air. It reacts really, really quickly and it reduces the hydrogen in the air. Uh, in the sorry, in the moisture in the air to being 
hydrogen gas very quickly, very exothermically. Um, but it's also really, really good at reducing other things. You can take a carboxylic acid, expose it to this, and you can turn it all the way into being a um, alcohol by just successively adding hydrides to that carbon. So we will spend lots of time with sodium boral hydride and lithium aluminum hydride when we get to oxygen-based reactions after the mixture. So that's neither here nor there. The boro, the hydroboration oxidation, that's our flag anti Markovnikov. It's still going to be a hydration reaction, but it goes for the anti Markovnikov, which means we'll start like this, break one of the pi bonds, put an OH on one side on the less substituted side because it's the anti Markovnikov, which then rearranges itself, right? That's an enol. So it's gonna rearrange itself, move the pi bond over the oxygen, move the hydrogen over to where the other side of the pi bond was. Three out of four, four out of four. The reason that I think it's worthwhile to show the enol, even though it immediately rearranges itself, is because that really makes the connection really obvious. It's still a hydration reaction. The net result is still you add a water molecule to it. And it starts the same way as our other hydrations do. It just then turns around so that the oxygen's on one carbon and both hydrogens are on the carbon next to it, um, just because it's more stable that way. The, this one we talked about, but just to draw it out, get something like what I would be looking for do something like, okay, don't change, don't change it where any of the carbons are. And I don't have the ability to erase to make that look cleaner, but you guys can see what it's supposed to look like. And then you'd wind up with, if you have a bromine down here, get a bromine up there. And then the mirror image. I messed that up. But I did see things drawn like that without the dashes and stuff in that research paper. Is that, is that like, that's like the way to do it? Well, so when you know what the general shape is here, then you don't need to show the dashes and the wedges because this carries with it its own three-dimensional shape, right? There's no way you could have this that doesn't look like a boat going in and out with sort of a bridge between the front and back, right? And so when you have that shape in your head, showing the extra little bit of, okay, well, this is really going away from you, that actually makes it look more confusing than what, rather than less. So with the bicyclics, when you have this shape, it's frequent, you frequently don't see the wedges and the dashes because we're just like, okay, everybody knows the convention. This is the easiest way to draw it. Um, the other way that you could do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one of these. <laughs> Better. Yeah, I definitely uh, got a strategy for drawing them now. It's, it works really, it's really easy when you have an eraser, you just draw two upside down Bs offset a little from each other. But when you don't have the eraser, guessing where to put that gap, it's really hard. Um, the other way you could do this, it would be easier to draw the enantiomer, which you draw it like this. And then instead of switching up versus down, draw it reversed the other way. So,
That's better. Hi. <laughs> That's also the enantiomer, right? So rather than trying to flip the up and down on which one's in front, which one's in back, and puts everything on top of each other, and makes it look really confusing. Um, you can just do it like this, where you literally just copy everything you just drew, like it's the mirror image, which is easier to understand when you're when you're trying to look at your structures. But you probably don't need to spend too much time on something that's unlikely to show up, and you can see it is it's a pretty small section. Here's another ozonolysis, right? It's not terminal, so we're not going to get CO2 out of the deal. We're going to get two molecules. Because the alkene, and you'll see this with alkynes too, because if it's symmetrical on both sides of the functional group, when you put it through ozonolysis, you get the same product twice, right? Because what's on the left side of the red line is the same as what's on the right side of the red line. So we're going to get acetone twice. Right? And so we see that anytime you've got symmetry, if you're really short on time and you recognize it, well, that's when you're going fast, you can always just do that. It's the most efficient way to do it, not even draw both of them. That's when you're in a stress situation though, that's probably not what you wanna be spending your brain power. You don't need to worry about that unless it's really obvious to you in the moment. I always used to do stuff like that. I try to get too cute on my tests and I wind up taking away points myself because I tried to make some sort of simplification to make it look better and more elegant when I didn't need to. And I messed up anyway. Doesn't look like anything else, right? All of our alkyne reactions, though, were some form of an addition reaction, or it was using the alkyne as a nucleophile, right? This is not that. So even if you don't remember what this is, it's got to be some form of an exception. It's not one of our clean reactions that we've dealt with that fits into our nice categories. So with that in mind, think, okay, what am I missing? What are the exceptions for all kinds? Oh, it's not a high hydrogenation, not full hydrogenation. It's not a poison catalyst. It's that other one, right? It's the dissolving metal reaction, which gives you a partial hydrogenation, but only with the trans product. If it said the other hydrations are really easy to recognize, right? If it's full hydrogenation, you see this. If it's the partial hydrogenation on a surface, then it's H2 and poison catalyst or Lindler catalyst. Don't poison the cat. <laughs> um, so this must be the other one. Surfaces always make it thin always make the cis isomer. So this must be the other one. In other words, gives us the cis, or sorry, the trans form. So counting them out, one, two, three, and then a cyclopentane, All right? So And maybe it's just me, something about the way I, I present these, but a lot of students, and I do this too, try to add an extra carbon when you do this. For whatever reason, going from it being straight line to being back to our 120 degree angles, it's really tempting to put an extra carbon in there. I don't know why, but when in doubt, count out your atoms. Make sure you still have all the same carbons attached the same way.
So that brings us to the mechanisms. And I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. This is just advice, not a rule. I would not <clears throat> put too much of the mechanisms on your half page of notes. Half page of notes is not enough to draw all the mechanisms that you need to have, right? Especially that one. And again, this is the mechanism that was chosen for when it was an open book for my students, specifically because I wanted them to have to show their work, um, even if they were just copying it from the page. Um, yours will probably not be these super intense mechanisms, but if you're prepared for these, anything that's called out as a mechanism is fair game. And so there's, you know, about four per chapter, a little bit more in some. Um, so, hydrohalic, you know, here's our addition reactions. The nice thing is that most of them are pretty similar to each other, other than hydroboration, which is the long one and ozonide. A lot of the rest of these go through those triangular intermediates as they're, and then wind up with a ring opening where another nucleophile comes in and breaks one of those bonds, right? So if you are putting anything about the mechanisms on your half sheet of notes, I would focus on the, the trickiest ones because the basic ones that seem really, really similar, those are the ones that, that you should be pretty close to fluent with. When it comes to, you know, you might still need to take your time and make sure you don't make any dumb mistakes. Like acid catalyzed bromination at this point should be really, really easy. Right? At least by Thursday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> I recognize that's still a whole 36 hours away. But um, so I would, you know, as a, as a way both to review and to decide to put what to put on your, your sheet, I would go through and I would write all of these out. Pick an example molecule, one that's done in the book or one that you just make up. Go write out every one of these mechanisms. And one, that should cement a lot of the similarities. And two, it'll, it'll really make it really obvious, okay, this is the one that I really struggle with. Maybe that is worth putting on you know, maybe you can fit the trickiest part on one part of your, you know, on a quarter of your half page. Um, but now we're talking really, really small at this point. You might need a magnifying glass, right? <laughs> oh, I know why I stipulated the photocopying thing. You're not allowed to write it at full size and then resize it to reprint it. That's why I brought that up. Somebody's done that before. Um, and that doesn't count. You're allowed, if it's your own handwriting, you're allowed to bring a magnifying glass if you need to. But you're not allowed to take two pages of notes, condense and resize it down to half a page and reprint it. And that's where we draw the line there. Um, and again, free radical reactions, those all should be pretty similar too, right? There are a couple wrinkles here and there, but for the most part, initiation propagation, termination. So if anything, you might just put for your free radical section of your notes, initiation, termination, or pro propagation, termination, and write out propagation should add up to total reaction or something like that. Because if you can get that, then you're 90% of the way to, to being done with that mechanism, right? And really, we did not do a ton of examples. We looked at a ton of examples, but I did not have you write out a ton of examples for the free radical reactions. You should be praying for a free radical mechanism because that is a mechanism where you can get 10, 10 out of 10 pretty quickly because it's always initiation, propagation, termination, right? And it's very little in the way of exceptions or weirdness with it.
And again, I'm less likely to ask some of the weird questions, the weird mechanisms. Um, not, this one's not that weird, but it's a little bit different than the basic ones. You guys being closed book or limited notes, I'm more likely to ask. You know, they're out of three mechanisms. Two of them will probably be pretty simple, maybe with the methyl shift or something in there. And maybe one of them is a tricky one. Yeah. Um, for that last one with the three radical part, mm -hmm. would you would, if, assuming you did give us one similar to that, mm -hmm. would you expect us to put the structure of NBS itself? No. Okay. Um, as long as you can show, I would be totally fine for your initiation if it was just R with a bromine. So if you showed that as your initiation, that would be acceptable. Just know that that's what NDS does, is it makes a bromo radical. So I was looking at it, oh, there's a nitrogen somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, it's, it's where the bromine's attached. Okay. Um, I think is succinamide, is that a biological molecule? I think that shows up in some reaction pathways in cells. Um, Succinic acid definitely does. I don't remember if succinamide does. Probably somewhere, some organism somewhere uses it. I would almost guarantee, um, even if it's in very small amounts. Can we go through this and like do the mechanism arrows for one of them? Yeah, absolutely. So. For regular reactions for chapter eight and nine, we're dealing regular arrows, right? Pairs of electrons moving at the same time, no free radicals. If it's a free radical mechanism, now we're talking about um, drawing the, the fish hook arrows. Oh, here's the other thing that I did to make it harder. And for you guys on the practice, um, I wanted it this way, but on the test, I'll give you what the product is. So you've got to be able to show me how you get from point A to point B, but I'll tell you where point B is. All right. So for this one, like I said, the, the first, what I would do for anything free radical is I would not start by trying to fill anything in over here. I would start by saying initiation, draw out your initiation step. And your initiation step for this one is going to be so if you do remember the structure you can draw it that's n bromosuccinamide if you don't remember that just make it an r group and that makes a bromine radical. Plus the other radical, but it's resonance stabilized and doesn't really react with anything. So we kind of just ignore it. Um, so you can write it in if you wanted to, but we're not going to do anything else with it from there. Boom, initiation, done. Propagation. Is bromine radical, steals a hydrogen from an allylic carbon. And actually, I'm even going to pause for a second and double check the mechanisms to make sure I'm not saying it. Uh, and actually, it didn't pull it out. The reaction summary is really, really easy. Chapter 10, right? There's only three reactions, really, um, that are significant. We covered some of the other ones, but we don't really. Um, these are the ones that we use most often, that you should be most worried about it showing up. 
Um, which means we can grab it from over here. So there's a propagation step. And I did not actually put that in there um, as a separate mechanism because it's one that I I wanted to surprise them with last year. I was being mean last year because it was open book. So really you should be thankful your test is not open book. <laughs> um, but anyway, let's go back. So what our propagation step would then look like is our bromine radical plus this molecule. And we want to draw out the hydrogen that's being pulled off. Because you're going to start, just like we have before, by pulling off a hydrogen to make a carbon radical, which then the second propagation step is going to be the, the radical we make here pulls a bromine off of endromosectinamide to brominate it. Um, and I believe we have to show something else in there to get it add up to the right overall reaction. Brad? Could we do times two for the initiation? Because that might cover it. Um, it not times two, but I think we do wind up using that succinamide radical does wind up playing a role in continuing the propagation. So that's where it probably shows up is again. Um, the, the, the first step though is going to be something like this. And then make This is an intermediate. And then that's going to steal a brom bromine from something, probably from endbromosuccinamide, but we need to do it in a way so that the adds up the right things cancel out. And so rather than guessing, I actually will go and pull it up on the from the textbook. And let me kind of Let's see, we're 13 there, we're not quite that far yet. That is Heinz, we're close. All right, so this is having trouble downloading fast enough to keep up with us. Hey, that's a perfect, perfect page. They're predicting the products. So we make HBR. And then the HBR we make turns around and makes BR2. That's the stuff that we're missing. 
So after the first propagation step, we made HBR. plus our radical. And then now you have a bromine, and that bromine reacts with this intermediate to give you the brominated version and another bromine radical. Again, I must have been feeling like they had it too easy having an open book when I when I wrote this test, um, because I made it one of the mechanisms that's not called out as a mechanism that's kind of buried in the middle of the text. Um, Sorry, Cody. <laughs> Yours will not be one of these on the test. Yours will be one of the ones that's explicitly called out. I didn't surprise them with it that much. I, I told them that everything was fair game because it was open book. I'm not that mean. And BR2 plus our intermediate. And drawing the arrows here would look like that. And didn't draw my BR2 bond. Right, that looks like a normal step. But the trickiest thing about this is you needed you needed to know that that happened. And that was sort of in the middle of a paragraph of text in the textbook. Brad? We could put BR2 plus R. Plus R, yeah. And that regenerates our bromine radical that we used up here in our first propagation step. and makes our brominated product. And now if we add up all three of these, we wind up with it adding up to our overall net reaction. Right, because you wind up with the you end up with succinamide at the end, but you end up with that radical canceled out by that radical. The BR2 is canceled out by using the BR2 over there. This radical that we made is canceled out right there. And our HBR is canceled out by the HBR. So the net result is just these two react together to make succinamide and the brominated product. And if I'm remembering correctly, I can't say nine out of 10, we didn't have 10 people registered, but last year, this was the, the question that had the least response. Everybody took their points other places and got maybe halfway through this one and decided either ran out of time or um, decided that they weren't gonna get those points so their time was better spent elsewhere, um, which was also kind of part of the point of the time pressure, right? Is you have to make those hard decisions and know where you have to accept missing the points and not be a perfectionist, which is hard. That really came out in grad school tests where it would be a five page test with only three problems. Um, and you would have three hours to do three problems and get only finish one of them, get halfway through each of the others in three hours. Um, 
but if you didn't at least try all three of them, you really were going to fail. Right. So you have to, we had to start, start a problem, get to it where you get stuck, go start the next problem, go till you get stuck, start the third problem, go till you get stuck, go back to the first one. Right. I'm not saying yours is going to be quite that bad, but again, strategy, optimize your time. And that's, that's why being quick on the reactions is really, really useful because that's 40 points that if you know it, you know it and you can go quick. Yeah. Uh, in this case, is there like a, a termination step? Do so yes, the, the last step would be a termination step and you know, essentially pick two of the radicals that show up. Probably this radical and a bromine radical would be the best termination okay. step. Okay. So I'm gonna clear this if we're good with my chicken scratch and draw the last termination step. When you can, based on the mechanism, you want to draw the termination step that gives you the product that, you, that you're ending up with. There are a couple of reactions like the one we were talking about today where that's not as not really possible um, because of the mechanism. It doesn't go through a way you can do that. But in this case, that would be the perfect termination step. But if you did everything else right on this problem and drew the a different termination step, but it was still a termination step, you're probably, that's like making a sig fig error. You know, if I'm going to mark you down, it'll be half a point out of 10. And just in general, when I'm grading these, getting for these ones, for the free radical ones, probably four points is just knowing that there's an initiation, propagation, termination, and doing your best in each of those sections, right? And everybody should be able to do that. Recognize it's a free radical reaction. The first thing you do is write those three words. Again, this is a tricky one because mainly just because it's long. Right, but you would start by making that bromo alkyl group. And then I made this one extra long because they had to show the enol papomerization at the end um, for a for full credit. Again, I must I must have thought that I, they had it too easy um, because I really was throwing throwing everything at them. Um, so the R would be just that uh, alkyl. Or you can just leave it as R. So part of the reason you do this is that you don't have to show it happening three times then. So you can show it happening once. And then. Oh, right. Yeah, there's that whole thing where you can get like. Uh, you can buy a dialkyl or... boring, yeah. Um, and you have to do that for the, al for the alkyne specifically. Because otherwise the alkyne reacts both of its pi bonds. If you want to keep one of the alpha, the pi bonds, um, then you have to use this version. But that means it only happens once, and your mechanism looks something like, um, you know, these this pair of electrons double check yourself on your arrows. Make sure you're drawing the you know not drawing fish hook arrow anymore. To make something that looks like R B R H and then our um, new functional group. So carbon, pi bond, and then one, two, three, one total of four carbon, one, two, three, four. which puts a, a positive charge because you broke a pi bond, right? Which then, and there's a negative charge on the boron because it's got more electrons than normal. 
then the next step looks like you shift the hydrogen over. And actually, if I'm remembering, right, it does not show this as a separate intermediate. It shows this happening to hydrogen shifting at the same time as you make the, the boron carbon sigma bond. And then you wind up with a boron with three alkyl groups. And then the next step was expose, when you expose it to oxygen source, you wind up adding oxygen boron bonds, which are even more stable. And then that can rearrange to put this carbon winds up attaching to the other side of an oxygen. Um, and make sure that you draw the right carbon the whole way to show that it's, an, it's anti-morphognitol. Right? And that one I know is up here. Right, so pi bond moves boron, hydrogen moves over here. If it's the alkyne, it looks the same, except you don't have two other hydrogens. You have two R groups. And you wind up leaving a pi bond right there. But then the next steps are still the same. You don't repeat it three times, but then the next step is the oxidation where you make this peroxide ion for hydroxide ion, hydroperoxide, hydrogen peroxide ion, I think is the real name there. Because a peroxide ion is just O2 with the negative two. Thank you. I guess that is what's written right there. So I guess if you want to trust a textbook. <laughs> um, yeah, you make a, a hydroperoxide or a hydrogen peroxide ion to be consistent with like hydrogen carbonate. We don't call it hydrocarbonate, we call it hydrogen carbonate. If you're being consistent with that way, you would say hydrogen peroxide ion. Um, anyway, that's neither here nor there. You make this. <laughs> which then comes and you add an oxygen to boron. So really the same thing we just did a second ago, you make that, you make a tetrahedral intermediate, which then rearranged to put the R group onto the oxygen from the boron. So you're back to boron being three bonds because that's where boron is the most stable. That's what makes boron so weird is that it's stable without a full valence, which means you've got an empty spot to bring in something new in a way that we don't with carbons, right? With carbons, if it's stable, if we're making a new bond, something else has to leave. Boron doesn't do that. And then again, if it's an alkene, we do that three times. If it's not an alkene, we would just do that once. And it does that specifically the boron bonds to, initially the boron bonds to the less substituted carbon because of the sterics. And that's what gives it the, the anti markovnik molecule. But then everything else is happening where the carbon's attached to the boron. So since the first step puts the boron on the less substituted carbon, everything else is anti markovnik from there on. All right. Um, I have to leave in like five minutes, but I just wanted to know, I didn't even know like where to start with section four. I, it was like really confusing to me. Um, so, and again, this is another example of, because it was open book, I threw something they hadn't seen at them. <laughs> It's the same idea as, as the synthesis problem. I just said, here's something you haven't seen before. Now use it in the synthesis. <laughs> as opposed to if you only have your half sheet of notes, I won't do that. Um, so you use the reaction above to suggest the synthesis pathway for the molecule below using it suddenly as your only source of carbon. That was the part where I was like, wait, what? <laughs> It is a fun puzzle. 
and there's but there's a couple of math my mathematical ways to think about it. it might not be the right way to phrase it but logic kind of levers there's a couple of things that if you can if you can you can basically tell yourself i have to use this reaction because for example this has an this has an odd number of carbons right how many carbons does acetylene have an even number. an even number so if acetylene is your only source of carbon you know you've got to do something to take away a carbon at some point, which tells you you've got to do an ozonolysis reaction at some point. So knowing that you're starting by putting three acetylenes together to make something that's C6, and then you have to cut one of them off, kind of gives you like, okay, well, I kind of have a little bit of a roadmap for where I'm going to have to go now. I, I know I've got to put three acetylenes together. Let's start with that. And see where that gets me. And then I, once you get that, I'm going to have to chop off one of those carbons. So let's see what I can do about that. You know, and that now, okay, now I'm talking ozonolysis, but we don't necessarily, but if we're trying to end here, it gets a little bit tricky. And that's where this one comes in. If you have a ketone, you can turn a ketone into an alcohol with an alkyne attached to it, right? So your fourth, or your sorry, your third acetylene that you're going to add, right? You might have to arrange it so that okay, well, how do I make a ketone? I only have one tool for making a ketone, right? I guess technically we have two. You have ozonolysis of an alkene will give you a ketone if you pick your ketone carefully. Or you have um, an, en an enol tautomerization, right? So now we're talking about an alkyne being, um, being hydrated. Cody? I kind of approached it differently. I tried to incorporate the reaction you showed. So I was using you know, like uh, formaldehyde. So there's one carbon that I'm using for that, and then two acetylenes to kind of build that. Except that you can't use, it says you have to use acetylene as your only source of carbon. So you don't have formaldehyde as a tool. It's a little contradicting though. It says use the reaction above. If I'm going to use the reaction above, I have to. You have to make a ketone. It means you have to start with. Acetylene is your only source of carbon. Not that you couldn't turn acetylene into a ketone. Although if you wanted formaldehyde, you could do uh, like any of the partial, like you know, poison catalyst, skip that down to the epine, and then you know, ozonolysis on that. Yeah. Ooh, right. So there's there's actually two ways you can do this. One would be to to make an alkyne, put two acetylenes together to make an alkyne um, that looked like and the angle's wrong, but that was just how to have it. So if you make this an alkyne and you could do a poison catalyst or the, the other one to turn that into the alkene and now you've got this, which now that you can turn around and do ozonolysis on, right? That's what, what Rigney was getting at, I think, and replace that carbon with an oxygen. I was, think, I was thinking there's probably a way you can do it with um, hydroboration to make the other one, but then we do need to cut off a carbon at some point. If we're trying to make something with six carbons instead of five, we could probably find a way to do it using hydroboration instead. And then now that gives you this molecule. This is the one that you turn around and plug into the reaction you're given up top. Use this as your target for your acetylene because then you're not your next acetylide.
is going to come in and attach right there and turn that into an alcohol, right? And then you've got three carbons. That's these three are right here. Here's the two carbons we just added. We just now we need to turn them from being an alkyne into being an alkene. And we have two ways of doing that too, right? So again, this one, I'm not going to throw a new reaction at you, but it might be some, it'll be a, a, a problem that's kind of like this. Here's where you're starting. How do you get to there? And you're going to have to be a little bit creative with how you arrange things along the way. Um, again, and I try to walk that fine line between it should be hard in the time you have and with the resources you have, but not impossible is what I'm going for. I don't always hit that, especially on the wild card and on the synthesis problems. <laughs> but I'll do the best I can, and it won't be quite this intense. Thank you. Right. That said, it's still a good prog, like, especially with that as a little bit of a primer. See if you can flesh that out and write the whole pathway, since I only gave you a couple of key points along the way. Um, it's just good practice. But again, he thought even number of carbons on acetylene, odd number of carbons on our target, you have to, you're going to have to use ozone, ozonolysis at some point. Yeah. And that's, I don't know if you'd call that a bottleneck, but as soon as you know that you have to go one way, that kind of really limits all of those other freedoms and kind of, it turns it into two simpler synthesis questions. Once you know that, right? How do I get to the thing that I want to put through ozonolysis? And then what do I do once I get through ozonolysis? Right, anytime you can narrow it down to, I have to use this reaction somehow. Yeah. I was going to say, I have to bring one of these <laughs> Ideally, we don't do that. Thank you, Sean. No problem. I'll see ya. All right. Anything else in particular? I have a couple of clarifying questions. Okay. Um, for page three, um, it asks um, which carbon hydrogen bonds have the lowest um, bond dissociation energy? And I saw a table in this textbook, you know, I think it was in chapter six, the thermodynamic section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Didn't help at all. So I'm a little confused on so, which one would be highest or lowest. So bond dissociation energy specifically means if you break it homolytically. Okay. So you're going to want to be looking at as though it was, and it goes into more detail at the beginning of the free radical chapter. Um, so like the basics are in the thermodynamics chapter, but most applicable here is if there's a carbon hydrogen bond. It's going to be whatever is going to make the most stable intermediate, okay. the most stable radical. It's going to have the lowest dissociation energy. Got it. Okay. So that means in this case, any carbon that has a hydrogen is, is a fair game, but the one that's going to give you the most stable intermediate is going to be that one, right? Because that's a quaternary carbon, which naturally you might progress to thinking, well, four is even better than three, but there's no hydrogen there. So. And then these are both primary, so that's gonna be the hardest to pull hydrogen off of. And then here's our secondaries, tertiaries of S. If there was a double bond present, then the allylic position or the benzylic position, one spot away from the double bond, would be the best. And then the next page, 
uh, when it was asking us, well, to put anything that applies. Um, right. Specifically for to be a an allelic position, does it have to be between the parties? Like for example, the bottom one. Um, I was thinking that perhaps maybe there was an allelic position on that one. Yeah. So and it's going from oxygen to carbon. Right. So technically, that's not an allelic. That's what we call an alpha carbon relative to the carbonyl group. It does have similar properties, but because it's an oxygen over here, it behaves a little differently because the oxygen's more electronegative than a carbon. Yeah. But we would not consider that a lilith. That's its, its own thing that we haven't gotten into yet. That said, for the for the course of the case of the test, if you put that a lilith, that would be a a minor a minor deduction, if anything, because structurally it is really similar practically in the lab when you actually start doing this stuff they behave a little differently for instance you can't brominate that spot the way we can brominate an allylic um, carbon but you can make it act as a base which is really or as an acid turns out alpha carbons have acidic protons because if you pull a hydrogen off, an H plus off there and have a next or negative, you get a resonance structure that puts a negative on the oxygen and a double bond there. So alpha carbons next to a carbonyl are extra stable when you, when you deprotonate them so they can act as an acid, which is not something you would expect unless you start incorporating resonance in. But again, beyond the scope for now. Just out of curiosity, would resonance play a role because they're the radical? If it was closer, if the radical was here, yes. Being there, you have two sp3 carbons on either side. You might see if this was a long enough, if this was happening, you know, in the gas phase where you, there's a long enough period of time that it could rearrange, which we don't usually see with radicals because they're so reactive. If it was happening in the gas phase, though, you might see this migrate over to put the radical there because then it's both tertiary and stabilized by resonance. But we would not expect it um, under normal circumstances. We go ahead and also. Okay. Yeah, I'll put uh, I'll put the link up for the recording when it's done, probably later tonight. Um, it needs to process, and I need to get valence to dance class. So, hope you guys have a nice evening. You too. See you, Cody. I have a question section one. Yeah. Um, and as I was uh, going through naming some of these compounds, I just had this flash of lack of confidence. I was like, all right. Uh, um, so I feel like pretty good about the first few, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of normal, you know, you, you want the uh, pi bond or the alkyne group to be like pretty much as low a number as possible. Correct. And longest chain incorporating that so you're not using it as side chain. Correct. Yeah. All right. Um, so and I don't know why this is like, uh, I don't like this. Uh, the so the fourth one with the bromine and chlorine in it. Mm -hmm. um, I wound up, you know, drawing out a thing and finding out if it was the R or the S. Yeah. Which I think I got wrong the first time. <laughs> and then I looked at it again. And I think I settled on S. That's what I settled on. Oh. At first I was like R, but it's like it was just like I just spatially I wasn't thinking about it. But uh, yes, it should yeah, be S. So that is that is two. It's, uh, two. It, it, it doesn't get weird because of the alpha group. No. Okay. It's especially considering that number four is just a hydrogen, right? Right. So you, you don't even have to go beyond one step away from the stereo center. Chlorine, bromine, carbon, hydrogen, all different atomic numbers. You don't even need to worry about it. It does get a little bit weird if this was another carbon, 
or several other carbons that were on the part sticking out towards us. Because then how do you assign a priority between something that's got more carbons in a row, but this is where the functional group is. And there is, I'm even a little shaky, I'd have to go back and review. Generally speaking, the rule is whatever is the most complicated and alkanes are not complicated. Um, it's going to be higher priority. But in this case, because it's everything directly attached to the different atomic number, that's all there is to it. So that is carbon one, just making sure. So, sorry, what? That would be carbon 20 now. And then the fact that this. This would be carbon one for, for a number. And for priority for this stereo center, um, we would say the bromine's highest priority to fluorine three of this carbon. But if we have three carbons in a row, the number that has to be carbon one because you want that to be as low as possible. That matters more than the halogens. And when you're unsure, whatever you're naming as a suffix has the highest priority in terms of keeping the numbers low. So because we name alkenes as a suffix, they're the one we care about more than the, the bromine and the chlorine. Yeah, so, so then the next one would be three, three dichloro, one cyclophosphine instead of one, one dichloro, two cyclophosphine. Correct. <laughs> All right, so then final answer here would be something like S three bromo three chloro one propene. Um, so I've sometimes seen it where the alkyne or alkene is one carbon one is not included. Is that kind of the standard or is it? That's only for cyclos. Um, because by definition, it has to be between carbon one and two on a cyclo. Okay. So you don't need to say one if it's on a cyclo. I guess for propene, I guess technically you don't need to say that because it has to be between carbon one and two on propene as well. Um, so that, I guess, yeah, you're, you're right. That, but once you get larger than propene, you need to specify because you could have one butene or two butene. Got it. And here, just to clarify, this has to be one, this has to be two because you have to count one to two. You can't call this carbon one and count that way. Right, because the one to two has to be between where the pi bonds are. But you wouldn't need to technically specify. You could just say three, three dichloro cyclooctine. Again, this lack of an eraser is really, really messing with me. It's there somewhere. I'm but sure it is. It I, is. I was playing around with one of these yesterday. Actually, you know where it is? Well, I only know where it is when you're on the canvas thing. Right. When you when you go to the full whiteboard, I can do it. Yeah. But when I'm looking at the screen, I can't do it. Yeah, I don't know. Without Maybe clearing the whole thing. Back. I try. It just writes. Yeah, but if we're here, we're good. And actually from here, I think I can show. There's a way to get to the desktop from here. Yeah, there's a way to do it, but it's not that critical at this point. So just been ignoring it. All right. Anything else in particular? Yeah, I have one last thing, but I'm going to bring it up. Okay. So I was trying to follow along with the mechanism, and how does this look? I think I'm missing something. I'm not quite sure. So there's your 
good. And then the HBr plus NPS makes a bromine, which then can be split and react with the radical. Good. And I, this is made already, and I know we ended it with another one. Are you saying that there's another one somewhere? So this is not your next propagation set. You already made the, oh, I see. You said equals that. And then this turns around and feeds back up to the top. Okay. So, but yeah, you're you're good. It's it's the three steps. It's this goes here, mm -hmm. these two, and then this and the NDS makes this. And then that, the bromine plus the radical we made in step one. Okay. Give us these products. I'll play around with <laughs> So, I mean, the main thing is is when you've got the space, and I'm going to try and make sure I give you guys lots of paper. Um, with the mechanism, sometimes it's it's worth the time, especially with the free radicals, to redraw on a new line every time, okay. just so you don't wind up with that happening. With the other ones where it's a continuous process and you're not pulling in random stuff from other steps, it's not as big a deal. Um, but for radicals especially, it right. be an advantageous. Hannah, how about you? How are you doing? Again, don't let the difficulty of the practice test throw you too much. Yours will be, I, I hesitate to point to any one thing and say, well, that part will be easier, but as a whole, it definitely will be. This was definitely the reach test because it was open book for them. That's how my every math class was last quarter. <laughs> it's, it's that or we have to deal with Proctorio and and then you've got compatibility issues and I don't know how foolproof it really is. And it's just easier to write the tests to be harder, um, which, yeah, that's, that is the way to ensure that it's equitable and fair to everybody. Yeah. So either of you guys or both of you guys go to tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I'll be working.